Thank you, Mr. McCrary. <clears throat> Miss, uh, Miss Sherry's been working with him for quite some time. <laughs> She's going to play for us next Sunday. So y'all be back. <laughs> no, that was great. Uh, it just kind of like last Sunday, we're so thankful for all the talent the Lord's given us. And uh, you're thankful to see him bringing up uh, even more talent right after, right after the next group. So praise the Lord for that. Uh, several announcements this morning. I say several, a couple. Not near as many as we've been having with all the Christmas rushes over with. But uh, next Sunday night on the 7th, we'll be observing the Lord's Supper service here at the church. Uh, so be sure to make plans to be here for the Lord's Supper. Uh, that'll be at 6 o'clock next Sunday night. Uh, looking forward to that. Uh, also, there is a sign-up sheet in the back for a Man Up Men's Conference. Now, they stole our name. We came up with that name for the Union Parish one. Um, but uh, they're doing it in Lincoln Parish this year. And, and they're doing the Man Up Conference. It's at the Ruston Civic Center, January the 26th. Any of our men who would like to go to this, sign up on the sheet in the back. Uh, and, and we're going to take care of any of the men that want to go. So we want you to come go with us if you can. Sign up for that, and we've got to have it to them by January the 18th. So Wednesday night the 17th will be our last opportunity to sign up. So sign up. There's a man named Hank Huff with Kingdom Dog Ministries. Um, and he's going to be doing a, a, a program and, and a message. Uh, I understand that he works with, with dogs because uh, they're a lot easier than people. Amen? So anyway, uh, to try to uh, show their obedience and, and his training methods and things like that. And, of course, it's all got a message tied in with it, so I know that it'll be a blessing. Uh, so be sure and sign up for that. Men, if you'd like to go, uh, we want to take a group and have a good showing. I uh, also want to remind you that January the 13th is going to be a celebration of love here at the Antioch Fellowship Hall. Uh, Mr. Kent and Miss Ann Halley will be celebrating their 50-year uh, anniversary, and so we're very proud for them. That'll be Saturday, January 13th, here at the church, 2018. Isn't that hard to say? Hard to believe that that's actually true. 2018, uh, from 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock in the fellowship hall here at the church. All right. Um, any other announcement we need to make something? Maybe didn't make the bulletin. All right. If not, we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. We're going to turn it over to Brother Ross. Father, we love you. And God, we thank you today for the privilege we have to be gathered in your house. Lord, we ask you today to meet with us. Uh, Lord, in whatever capacity you see fit to minister to our heart, we pray, Lord, that you do what you will. We'll be careful to thank you for it. God, we always pray if there's one person here today without Christ, we pray that they'd be saved. Uh, Lord, they might come to Jesus today. Lord, for our church, I pray that we'd be challenged as we come to the conclusion of a year. Lord, it's been a challenging year for a lot of people, for a lot of families. Uh, but God, we can sit at this last day of this year and still say thank you because you've just been good to us. For your blessing, Lord, for the privilege we've had to endure hardship, but God, also to embrace the joy that comes with walking with you and serving you as a church. I pray, God, that we will uh, be obedient today to whatever it is that your word might put on our hearts. And we pray again that your will be done in every family, every home that's represented here today, and we're going to be careful to give you all the glory for what's done, and it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. All right, let's sing page 359. This is the day. This is the day, this is the day that the Lord hath made, that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice, we will rejoice and be glad in it, and be glad. Page number four, to God be the glory. To God be the glory.
still stand with me for offertory here. Page number 15. Let's sing, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Come thou fount of every blessing To my heart to sing thy grace Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise Teach me some melody song in, Sung by flaming tongues above Praise the mount I fixed upon it Mount of thy blood. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy grace, Lord, like a fetter, by my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts I wanted to sing this song this morning because it shows something about us starting a new year and uh, knowing who holds tomorrow. Let me sing Because He Lives. God sent His Son. They called Him Jesus. He came to face tomorrow because 
sing that with me. Because he lives. So that is a great song, I guarantee you. Somebody that wrote that song had done some living. Amen. <laughs> if you have a Bible this morning, if you will, open with us to the fifth chapter of the fifth book in the Bible, the book of Joshua. Joshua chapter 5 is where we'll be this morning. Uh, somewhat of my New Year's message uh, to us today, uh, that I pray the Lord will take it and use it uh, in a mighty way. Joshua chapter 5, uh, as you find it, if you will, stand with us as we honor the word of the Lord. Joshua 5, we'll begin reading there in verse 9. The Bible says, And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off you. Wherefore, the name of the place is called Gilgal unto this day. And the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at even in the plains of Jericho. And they did eat of the old corn of the land of the mor on the morrow after the Passover, unleavened cakes and parched corn in the self-same or very same day. 
And the manna ceased, verse 12, on the morrow after they had eaten of the old corn of the land. Neither had the children of Israel manna any more, but they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. Father, I pray this morning that you'd take this word. God, that you would dissect it and distribute it as you see fit. I pray, God, that there would be a portion for everybody in the room today and that you'd minister greatly to our hearts. I pray, God, that we'll seek you as we desire to do your will. And I pray, God, that that'll be done in this service. We'll be careful, Lord, to give you the thanks and praise because you're the only one in here that's worthy. And it is in the name above every name that we do pray. In the name of Jesus, amen. You can be seated. I want to bring a message to you this morning on the subject or the thought out of this passage of Scripture. When God gives a new beginning. When God gives a new beginning. New Year's is a great time for a lot of people because it's a time to start over. It's a time that we, if you will, hit the reset button in our lives and we begin to take inventory. And we start thinking about all the things that we'd like to do that we haven't done. All the things we'd like to quit doing that we've been doing, right? Uh, again, we wage war on carbs and sugar. And we, and we do everything that we can to try to get things back in order. But as you look to this passage of Scripture, if I can catch you up for just a minute. If you remember now for 40 years, Moses has led the children of Israel on a wilderness journey. Led them from uh, the borders of Egypt to the borderline of the Canaan land. And as they came to that place, as God fulfilled His word, everybody who was, who was in the wilderness except those who were born there died. And then God raises up one in Joshua to lead the children of Israel over the Jordan or through the Jordan into Canaan land. And the first place that they come to is Gilgal. When they got to Gilgal, there was some things that they needed to, to take inventory as far as the people were concerned and some things that they felt like they needed to do. Some changes that need to be made uh, and some adjustments as far as their character and as their people that needed to be addressed. Now I want to say to you, first of all, to get to the place where God gives you a new beginning. You think about that 40 years, you think about God raising up Joshua after one of the most prolific people leaders in all of history in Moses. And God raises up Joshua and gives him the task to take those people where Moses couldn't take them. And Joshua had to do so simply by the word of the Lord and by his faith in God. And so I would say to you, to get to the place where God gives a new beginning, it takes courage. The Bible says when Joshua was spoken to by God when he called him in chapter 1 and in verse 9, the Bible says that God speaks to Joshua and asks him this. He said, Have I not commanded you to be strong and of a good courage and be not afraid? Neither be thou dismayed. Uh, uh, he said, The Lord thy God is with you whithersoever you go. And so he, he tells Joshua, I'm going to be with you and I'm going to lead you. I'm going to give you strength. I'm going to give you the ability to go and accomplish what I've called you to accomplish. But you've got to obey me. And so to get to the place before the new beginning started, it took courage. Not only did it take courage, but it took commitment. One of the first things that they did after they crossed the River Jordan and they came to Gilgal is they looked around and what author Pink called a, a, a blessed omission was the reality that every man that was born in the wilderness had not received the covenant sign in his flesh of the Abrahamic covenant. And that was that God had called Abraham to take all of the Hebrew men and to circumcise them, to bear in their flesh the mark of the, of the faithfulness of God and the covenant of God. And all of those who had been born in the wilderness had not yet done so. And so the first thing that they do at Gilgal is they go back and they see all the things that God had told them to do that they had not yet done, and they did those things. And so as the men received the covenant sign in their flesh or the promise of God, as the men followed through with this commitment, you begin to see God preparing them for this new beginning. It took courage to come to the place of a new beginning. It took commitment, I believe you would agree, to make that decision of obedience, to do what God had called them to do. And I would say to you also, to get to the place of a new beginning, it takes consistency. It takes more than one big day. It takes more than one fine gesture. It takes more than one service. It takes more than one uh, uh, oath. It takes a, a, a body of 
consistency that in order for me to get where I need to be to really embrace this new start, to really embrace this reset, to really embrace this new, I have got to consistently pursue the Lord. One of the most <laughs> remarkable instances of that in Scripture to me, and, and I fast forward you to the book of Acts in chapter 2 at the Pentecost. Now the Spirit of the Lord has fallen on the church and the Bible says that 3,000 people have been saved. It says there in verse 41, when they had received the word, they were baptized the same day they were added unto the church, 3,000 souls. If there ever was a time, do you hear me? To throw your feet up and say thank you Jesus and have a party or a celebration or take a day off, I believe it would have been verse 41. But do you know what it says in verse 42? It says, and they continued. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking bread and in prayers. The Bible says that even though they had experienced a great victory, even though they had crossed over Gilgal, they understood that they had to consistently serve the Lord. I would, I would hope if you were here last Sunday that you would agree that the Lord gave us an unusually good service. But that does not remove us from the reality that we had to pray and study and prepare to come and seek God for another good service today. That we got to understand that though God has blessed, we still need a blessing. Though He spoke, we still need a word. Though He's moved, we still need Him afresh and anew to rest His hand on His people and to get to that place of a new beginning. It takes courage, it takes commitment, and it takes consistency. You might not get what you need this Sunday. Don't give up on God. Come back next week. Come back and listen for what God's saying. I promise you He's got something for you. We've got to keep plugging. We've got to keep pushing. We've got to keep on doing what God's called us to do. And it might not always seem like there's a fountain of blessings being poured out on us. But I guarantee you one thing, there's a fountain of blessing. We just got to keep doing what God's called us to do. And when He sees fit in His time, He'll tip it over <laughs> and spill a little bit out on us. And man, what great days those are when God sees fit to do so. But till then, it takes faithfulness it takes consistency it takes a commitment to us doing what we know God's told us to do even when we don't feel like it even when it don't look right don't sound right we got to keep on doing it. what God said to do because that's where the blessing lies so what was it then that you see about Gilgal that, that we consider I want you to think about three things with me this morning when God gives a new beginning when God gives a new beginning I want you to see first of all in verse 9 there's forgiveness for our past when God gives a new beginning, there's forgiveness for our past. The Bible says in verse 9 that the Lord said unto Joshua, This day have I rolled away the reproach of Egypt from off of you. Wherefore, the name of that place is called Gilgal unto this day. I want you to think first of all about what it is that God said. God said, I'm going to roll away the reproach of Egypt from off of your back. Now, we know anybody that's studied Bible and studied what they call typology or things that typify things from the New Testament, the Old Testament points towards those things. One thing resembles another or reflects another in order to make a great message, a, a continuation of what it is that God's trying to say. When you consider that, I want you to think about this. When God makes that statement, that I've rolled away the reproach from Egypt off of you, this is a parallel to God forgiving us of our sin. This is a parallel of God understanding that we have to be forgiven, but we also need to be told that we were forgiven. That God has to confirm to us that we've been forgiven. And God speaks to them through Joshua and He says to them, I have rolled away the reproach from off of you. They had already crossed the Jordan. They had already came into Gilgal. They had already received the blessing. They had already made a decision to obey God. God did not owe them anything. But God still saw fit to speak. And how many of us can remember times in our lives when God didn't owe us a thing, but He was willing and faithful to speak? Maybe through a song, maybe through a sermon, maybe through a testimony or through a prayer that God would be so good to us that He didn't have to speak, but He chose to because He loved us and He cared for us as His people. What he's saying here is, is I have rolled away the reproach of sin from off of you. What God said, but think about this. What he's saying is what he did. What did God do here? Well, what God did to them 
is he gave them the full embodiment of forgiveness. And what he's saying to them here, that word reproach means disqualified, disqualifier. And so what God did was he took away what, was, what, what had caused them to be disqualified to be what God had called them to be. Listen, you got a room full of sinners in here this morning. you got a room full of disqualified people. Nobody in here is, is worthy. You heard me pray earlier about God getting the glory because He's the only one that's worthy. Because nobody in the house this morning is worthy to do what we do. None of us are worthy to be a member of the Lord's church. None of us are worthy to be a part of the Lord's ministry. None of us are worthy to be in the, in the fountain of His blessing. I think about where I've been born. You didn't get to choose where you were born. You could have been born anywhere on this earth. Aren't you glad you were born in this country? Aren't you glad you were born in this part of this country? Lord, I'm so thankful that God, I don't know why He did what He did the way He did it, but I'm thankful, and I know that people in other places feel the same way about where they're from. It was not that we're exclusive, but I just thank God for what He's done for me. And when you think about all of those things, you realize that we as sinners have disqualified ourselves from being good at anything. From being good for anything. We did a hee-haw pageant one time. Not pageant. Hee-haw banquet one time at Pilgrim's Rest. And they had Jessica set up. You remember the cornfield on hee-haw? Where they'd play the little music and people pop up in the cornfield and they'd have the little cute one-liners? Well, one of them said, I married a grocer so I could eat for nothing. Somebody else said, I, I married a banker so I could do something else for nothing. And then Jessica popped up and said, I married a preacher so I could be good for nothing. Right? <laughs> <laughs> the reality is because we're all sinners we have tainted our value and so what God says to them is what God says to you and me today under the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ it's not by your good merit it's not by your good deed it's not by your good nature or even your right decision by the blood of the Lord Jesus and the grace of Almighty God, I have removed. It doesn't mean it wasn't there. I have removed the disqualifier. I have taken away that which tainted you for the service of the Lord, and I've made you a quality candidate for the position that I've called you to fill. God's not asking you to do something you can't do. God's asking you to do something that He knows you can do. That's what you were made for. And so when we think about a new beginning, I want to remind you that when you come to this place, when God gives a new beginning, there is forgiveness for the past. He said, I've rolled away this reproach. What's interesting here, as God makes that statement, rolled away, I want also for you to notice this. Not only what he said and what he did, but I want you to think about what Gilgal meant. Now, by definition, the Hebrew word for Gilgal means a rolling wheel. And God says, I have rolled the reproach of Egypt from off of you. But it also implies here that Gilgal was not a destination. This new beginning is not a destination. Another, another commitment is not a destination. It's just a step to get us to the place God wants us to be. We said last Sunday that a power service, when the Spirit shows up and heaven falls, that service is not to magnify that service. That service is to magnify the Lord in our hearts so that we'll take the initiative to go out and tell people about Jesus. We want to go out and share the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Gilgal meant that God had forgiven their sin, that He had honored their obedience, and that these Hebrew children had, listen to this, had reestablished the hand of God on their doings. Now the only reason that means something is that this is a group of young people who had to bury their loved ones in the wilderness because of their disobedience. They had seen the God who had promised to deliver them from Egypt to the promised land cause their families and their nation to wander in the wilderness until a generation of people had died. Can I stop right here and tell you something? If your generation doesn't want to enter into the promised land, God will let you die in the wilderness and He'll let the next one die in the wilderness and He'll let the next one die in the wilderness until somebody wants to go with God. He don't owe us nothing. He don't care. He don't listen. He, he holds no reservation. If we want to sit here and toil in the wilderness, He will let us die and raise up a group that will go. And that's exactly what this group had seen. So you understand me when I say they grasp the gravity of what it meant to obey God and have His hand on their lives. 
something we seem to have lost in our mindset in the family and in the church of America today. That we are totally dependent, not on the bank account, not on the trust fund, not on people and their giving, not on your checkbook, not on your good merit, not on your yeas or your nays in a business meeting. But that we are totally dependent as a church on the hand of God being on our people. And that we pray and we repent and we seek His face so that we might have the hand of God. Because if the hand of God's on this church, it don't matter who of us is in here. It don't matter big eyes or little U's. If God's here, it's going to be what it's supposed to be. Amen. And we can bank on that. We can rest in that. We can draw strength from that. And so when you consider this new beginning, they were so excited at Gilgal because even though they had crossed the Jordan, they'd made this commitment, they had done everything they were supposed to do for God to speak to them and say, Listen, (laughs) my hand's back on you. I've rolled away the reproach. I've taken away the disqualifier. And I'm giving you the grace to be what you desire to be for my glory. This was a happy day. For the nation of Israel. Not only when you consider a new beginning. Is there forgiveness for our past. But I want you to see second of all. That there's faithfulness in our progress. One of the quickest things. People are so quick. You remember there were ten lepers that came to Jesus. Needed to be healed. Jesus healed all ten of them. And they all ten took off. One of the ten turns around. Comes back and thanks him. And Jesus asked him that question that has burned in my mind ever since I've read it and a couple of times that I've preached it. Jesus says, where are the nine? It's so easy for us when we're in a season of progress, when we're in a season of blessing, when we're in a season of the fountain flowing in our lives to not remember the things that got us there. And that was the simple worship of the God that we serve. Even when it's bad, even when it's ugly, even when we don't feel like it, even when our hearts are broken, that we worship King Jesus, not because of our situation, but because of His standing. And that is that He is the King of the kings. I got to tell my kids the Christmas story the other night, and we were talking about kings, and we said something about kings, and I said, let me tell you about Jesus. Jesus was the king. He is the king. And every king that ever has been a king will kneel to Him because the Bible says He's their king. He is the king of the kings. Every mythology, every story, every tale, everyone that's ever claimed to be a God or a Lord, the Bible says he's the Lord of them. But they're going to all shudder and kneel in his presence because he is the king of kings and he is the Lord of lords. He got his hand back on his people. There's going to be forgiveness for our past. There's going to be faithfulness in our progress. Notice verse 10. The Bible says, And the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal. They set up camp, and the Bible says they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month at even in the plains of Jericho. They were between their greatest move of God in the lives of this group of people. This is the greatest thing they've experienced. They were born in the wilderness, and now they've crossed the Jordan under the prophetic teachings of the Word of God And they've seen God move. They've heard God speak. They've seen them accomplish things that they never dreamed could be accomplished. They've set up camp. And yet in this great move of God, they set up their camp in the shadow of what's going to be the greatest battle that was ever fought. And that was the battle of Jericho. And so as they set up camp between this this miraculous move of God and what's to be their greatest test since they've left Egypt, The greatest test in the lives of any of these people who have ever been born. Their their whole life they've never been tested like they're fixing to be tested. They pull over, they set up camp, and they worship Jesus. They pull over, they set up camp, and they worship God. It's to be said today that we are a busier people than we've ever been, yet we accomplish less than we've ever accomplished. We're running wide open in a hundred different directions and it's incredible to me how we have just willingly omitted God from our lifestyle. And how we've God has become something that's on the side. God's something that if we have time for Him, we will serve Him. If we can find a moment, we'll show up. If we can, we will. But if we can't, you know, it is what it is. Everybody else, listen, we've been having church on Sunday since Jesus. 
Right? Well, people say, well, if they didn't do that on Sunday, we'd be there. Well, we've been doing this on Sunday since before they was them. <laughs> Amen? So why don't you flip that pie around, give them a slice out of the other side and say, hey, if we didn't have church on Sunday, we'd be there. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> Lord, have mercy. <laughs> Sunday's church day. Sunday's go to meeting time. We'll be in the house of God, worshiping Jesus, singing praises, doing what God's put us here to do. They got in this place where not only did they experience the forgiveness of their past, but in their progress, they said, you know what? We're going to stay faithful to the God that got us here. And they pulled over on the 14th day and they observed the Passover. You read Exodus chapter 12, you'll find the account of the Passover where God comes and tells those people, he says to them in camp in Egypt, he says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to kill the firstborn. This was the first month of their year, he said. I want you to kill the first lamb. I want you to kill a young male lamb, a year old, spotless and without blemish. And I want you to take the blood of that sacrifice and I want you to put it on your doorpost. And when I come through in the night, everybody who has the blood on their doorpost, I'll spare. That's the Passover. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. And then they ate the meat of the lamb that was slain. And they celebrated the Passover and the mercy and the grace of Almighty God. And so even at this juncture where they find themselves, God has spoken, God has moved. Here they are at Gilgal. They said, you know what? We're going to pull over and we're going to observe the day that got us here. That's the day that all of us can celebrate. And that was the day that the blood covered our sin. That's what got you here. Don't you ever forget it. I hear them on these singing shows. They get up there and they sing some old ridiculous, worldly song. And they'll ask them, well, how did you start singing? They say, well, I started in church. I started singing in the choir. I started singing up there at church at my mamaw's or my papaw's church. Or we did what we did. And then they end up doing this old crazy stuff. And you want to tell them what we've all heard all our lives. Don't forget where you came from. Don't forget where you came from. As we sit here this morning, some of the most blessed people in all the world. As we sit here this morning, citizens of the best country in all the world. I believe in the best part of the best country in all the world. I'm glad to be a southerner. Amen. I'm proud of our heritage. I thank God for who I am. And as we sit here today and all the favor and all the blessings of God has been poured out on our lives, I want to remind you as we see the apathetic seeds of doubt the devil sows to draw us away from the devil's serv- or the Lord's service, don't forget where we came from. Don't forget what got us here. The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that washed us from our sin, that pulled us out of the pit of hell. You were so excited about church the day God saved you. You ought to be just as excited because you're just as saved today. Amen. It was a celebration of forgiveness as they set up the Passover. It was worship for the Father. When this new beginning takes place, There is forgiveness of the past. There's faithfulness in the progress. And lastly, in verse 11 and verse 12, there's favor along life's path. I don't know. There's some things that I read that have punch to them. There's things that I read in Scripture sometimes that, man, when I read them, they really grab my heart. And this was one line in this verse that really got a hold of me, and this is really what set up the message for the whole thing for the new year. When he says there in verse 11, let's just read that and then we'll read verse 12. They did eat of the old corn of the land, and that was the morrow after the Passover. So the day after the Passover, they ate the corn of the old land, the unleavened cakes, the parched corn, and the selfsame day, which is the very same day. Now in verse 12, and the manna ceased on the morrow. Now if you remember, God gave manna every day except the Sabbath. On the Sabbath, he gave manna the day before, which was enough for the next day so that they could do that. But if he took up too much manna, it would spoil. It wasn't good for two days. It was provision for one day. This is a picture of the Lord Jesus and His provision and what He does for us, His daily uh, part in our lives. And so at this manna, they had been fed through the wilderness. And there was times that they mourned. There was times that they complained. There was times that they were unhappy about the provision of God, but it didn't cease. God took care of them. God took care of them through the wilderness. And over 40 years, you could see where they may have come a little bit dependent and a little bit entitled to understanding this is the day we're going to get the manna. Well, the manna stopped which was a good thing because sometimes the manna has to stop for you to trust the Lord. And what I love about this verse in verse 12 is it says that neither did the children of Israel have the manna anymore, listen to this, but the, 
But they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. What this means is they had to give up what they were used to. They had to give up what nurtured them in the wilderness journey in order to step into the provision and the favor of Almighty God. I heard a guy say this one time. The biggest enemy of great is good. What keeps us from going as far as we need to go is the comfort of where we are. And if we're not careful, we'll set up shop at Gilgal. And here's what happened after Gilgal. The provision of the manna dried up. But the greatest military victory in the history of the world took place at Jericho and they marched through Jericho. They possessed the land and the manna was no more because they were eating the fruit of the land. And remind you that the land is a picture of the promise of God. We rob ourselves of enjoying the fruit of the promise of God when we hold on to yesterday. When we let our sin rob us of our service. When we let our past prevent us from going on and doing what God's called us to do in the present. When we sit here in yesterday's victory and we lose today, worrying about tomorrow, because we won't trust God, because we won't dig in and believe Him, because we won't remain obedient to what God's called us to do. When God helps us and allows us to start over, when God gives us a new beginning, Listen to me. There's forgiveness. You'll be forgiven for those things in your past that have haunted you and kept you from doing what God has called you and put you here to do. There's going to be faithfulness that's required of us along the way in order to keep us mindful of who it is that brought us here. We set up shop and we worship Jesus. That's why we meet here every week. That's why we come to church on Sundays. That's why we have Bible study on Wednesdays because it keeps us grounded. Used to be a preacher in Sibley that had a church, and they're, they're saying in their church was grounded in the word, going forth in Christ. And I always thought that was good. We stay grounded in the word by staying in the word. You're not reading your Bible like you're supposed to. You know you're not. Read your Bible. Read your Bible. Get in church. Get in Sunday school. Get in with us on Wednesday nights. The Lord's going to bless you for it. I'll tell you this make me a deal. You give me the month of January, you come every service we have in January. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, visit a Sunday school class. If at the end of January, God doesn't bless you for what you've done, put a note on my desk. God didn't bless me, and I'll give you a free pass. You'll never have to come to Sunday school again. Never have to come to another Wednesday night service. You can just come and do what you do. Do it what you do, when you do it, when you do it, how you want to do it, we don't care. But if he blesses you, you got to get up here on Sunday and tell the church. No, I'm playing. If he does, <laughs> you bear down and keep coming and watch what the Lord will do for you and your family. You know if you read four chapters a day, you can read the Bible in a year. Four little chapters. you got time to read four chapters. You read the Facebook news feed five, six hours a day. You don't have to read all four at one time. You can read two in the morning, two in the evening. Do you know if you read five chapters a day, you can take the weekends off? And you can read five chapters five days a week, and by Christmas you'll be read the whole Bible. You ain't going to do it. You didn't do it last year. Read the Bible. Turn that mess off. You've got to keep up with all the news. you kept up with it. You can't remember none of it, and you're just as messed up as you were last year, like a rabbit in a bush hole. Huh? You ain't no better off this year than you were last year because of keeping up with the times. Read the one thing that never changes. The one thing that an election won't alter. Get in the Word. Let God minister to your heart and your family. Quit being lazy. You're going to stand before God one day and you're going to wish you'd have read this book. Ain't nobody that read it is going to stand before Him and say, you know what, I shouldn't have read so much Scripture. <laughs> read your Bible. Pray. Give God some time. He gave His Son for you. He should, Jesus Christ came from heaven to this earth and wrapped that cross around his back and bore your sin to die for you because he loved you that much. To save your soul, to give you a home in heaven, to give you a place to come to church, to put a Bible. Do you know what Joshua and this crowd would have done to have held a Bible in their hand? 
to be able to have what we've got waiting down the dash of our car, leaving them on pews during the week, taking them home, putting them on the coffee table. Read your Bible. You don't understand the treasure that you've got. You've got a bank account full of money and you left a checkbook at the house. Read the book. God's going to bless you for it. Do you hear what I'm telling you? Do what God's called you to do. This is the evidence of the favor of God. This is where He ministers. This is where He speaks. This is where He shows us. That's why you don't come up here and hear the chronicles of Rube. You don't want to hear from me. We want to hear from God. And that's why we do this. Let God minister to your heart. Let God minister to your heart. And I'll admit to you, that manna's going to stop. That stuff that gave you strength, that stuff that gave you nourishment, that stuff that you've become dependent on, it's going to dry up. If you, if you make this commitment, it's going to dry up. But you're going to eat the fruit of the promise of God this year. That's what he said. I know that there had to be people when that manna went away, they looked around and said, uh-oh, what have we done? Because they said the same thing when they went out in the wilderness and started eating the manna. God started blessing them with manna, and all of a sudden they said, boy, we ate a lot better than this back in Egypt. Then they spend 40 years eating manna. They come into the promised land. The manna's gone. They're looking around. Where's the manna? <laughs> it's time to trust God. And because they did, the Bible says, and I don't know why that grabs me, they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. Buddy, they walked through Jericho. Insur insurmountable odds for them to go through Jericho because of their walls and God brought them down and they walked through Jericho they suffered victory then at Ai they suffered defeat but God was building a group of people to be warriors for him and of course you know you keep reading you keep reading it gets better <laughs> when God gives us a new beginning We've got a chance to do something we've never done before. You hear me? Never in the history of the world. You can go back through every preacher, every pastor we've ever had, every year, every generation, everybody from the founding of this church in 1899. I'm going to tell you we're fixing to do something that we've never had an opportunity to do as a church. You know what that is? Live in 2018. What are we going to do? When God gives us a new beginning... We've got to embrace our forgiveness. We've got to continue in faithfulness. And we've got to embrace His favor in our lives in order to trust Him and be all that God wants us to be. I believe God wants more from us than what He's got. And I know that because I know we've got more to give. Amen. 2018. Can I get a witness? If you're here this morning and you've never been saved, I want to invite you today to give your life to Jesus. I want to invite you just to get all of it out of the way. Listen to me. You're going to hell if you die without Christ. You're going to spend eternity in a fire, in hell. You ain't coming back. It's over. Do you hear me? Grim, unpopular, doesn't make you feel good. I get it. I know it doesn't. I hate saying it, but it's the truth. But Jesus Christ died so that not only you'd have a home in heaven, though that is huge, that you'd have a home in heaven, but that you could have peace in your heart right this very moment. You could walk out of this building today with peace in your heart that all of this uncertainty that rattles our brains, that if all of that would just come crashing down on us, that we know we got a home in heaven. And we know God's going to take care of you. You can have that if you'd be saved today. And if you are saved today, I pray you'd look in the depths of your heart and ask the Lord, what do you want from me that I've not been given? And you do what God says do. You surrender your life to the Lordship of Christ and let's be what God deserves for us to have been and wants us to be in 2018. Stand with me if you will. Father, bless this word. Use it, Lord, to accomplish what it is that you desire to accomplish in this invitation. And God, we do pray for that one that's nearest to hell. God, that sits there in their conviction right now trying to weigh out what they need to do. If there's one person, if there's a dozen in here today that need to be saved, I pray by your mighty hand that they'd be saved today. Lord, they won't do it because of my preaching. They won't do it because of, uh, of their will. But they'll do it because they surrendered to yours. And I pray today you'd give them the grace to do just that. As for the rest of us, Lord, I pray that we would surrender to your will for our lives and that we'd be faithful to your call. Bless this invitation. Do what you will. We're going to thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.